leaders as well as recent hires and alumni and then have opportunity at the end uh, to ask questions. Sorry, one sec. I forgot I was the one driving this. <laughs> okay, um, so my name is Chris Baker and uh, I'm the senior director and like my colleagues uh, with me here tonight, I'm in the corporate performance improvement business unit based here in the Southern California market. I'm a former industry operator with over 20 years of uh, career, career experience in information technology working for Fortune 500 companies in the application and in the transformation of enterprise business technologies. I joined AM five and a half years ago and uh, have been leading campus recruiting here at USC each year and I'm super excited to be here with you all tonight. Uh, and I would be one of those alums uh, that I was referring to. So uh, I'm gonna go ahead and pass the baton over to Morgan to introduce herself. And then I'll be back uh, towards the end uh, to tell you a little bit about uh, the full-time position for which we are recruiting, as well as some key details about our application process. I'm good. Hey, Baker, would you, would you mind putting the slides in uh, presentation mode, please? How's that? Perfect. Super. Awesome. Morgan? Great. Morgan, are you on the line? Okay, I, I don't think Morgan's joined us quite yet. I'll go ahead and introduce myself. I'm Forrest Malchow. I am a manager uh, in the Los Angeles office as well. I've been with A&M for about four years now. Um, before that, I got my MBA at UCLA Anderson. Natalie, do you want to go ahead and introduce yourself? Sure. Hi, everyone. Natalie Barron. Um, I'm a recent grad of USC. I graduated in 2019 and joined um, straight after that. So I've been with the firm for just over a year. Excited to see everyone tonight. Hey, everyone. Um, I'm Neha Patel. I graduated from USC this past May and joined a and a little over a month ago. Um, so excited to be here and see some fellow Trojans. Um, and I'll hand it off to James. Hi, everyone. Uh, James Chow, consultant in the LA office. I joined about the same time as Forrest. Um, also got my MBA from UCLA Anderson. All right, so I'll pick it up. So I'm Ben Hope. Um, I'm a managing director. Uh, I've been with the firm just about two years, and prior to that, I spent uh, a little bit more than uh, 20 years in the media and entertainment business. So um, former uh, CFO of CNBC Business Channel. Um, I was also the West Coast CIO for NBC Universal and uh, the CIO for Fox Networks Group. So. My background is a little different than uh, you might expect from a very senior person at a consulting firm in that um, I come from, uh, from a, a business background as opposed to consulting background. We're gonna talk to you a little, a little bit about that later on in, in our presentation and how that's a differentiator for us. And I went, uh, I went to, uh, my graduate degree is uh, MBA from Columbia. And Scott? Great, and I, I don't think we have Ramin with, with us tonight, but I do know we have Scott with us. So Scott, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure, uh, Scott Haug, I'm also Managing Director with AM. been with the firm about three years. Uh, my focus is on uh, strategy growth and uh, spend a lot of time in the FinTech and high tech sector. About 25 years of consulting experience and I spent four years as part of the pre-IPO leadership team at MasterCard, so excited to be here. And we've got a great crop of USC analysts, so excited to get some more. All right, so. Great, thank you. So let's tell, talk to you a little bit about a and And for those of you who were at any of our prior uh, presentations, whether it's our recruiting night, our Marshall uh, Women's Leader Board or Professor Plotz's class, um, this might be a little repetitive, but I want to tell you, and I do see a lot of familiar faces, which is great. Um, let's tell you a little bit about the a and m and 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 our the history of our firm. So we're about thirty five years old, uh, about a little over a two billion dollar company. Um, we have about four thousand employees. 
uh, worldwide uh, across 50 offices in 20 different countries. So very sizable firm. Um, you know, we like to joke we're the largest, probably the largest consulting firm you may never have heard of. Um, but we are a, a, a full service, large firm, global firm. Um, and as you can see from this particular slide, um, very diverse set of, of um, uh, things that we bring to the marketplace, services we bring to the marketplace. What we're going to talk to you tonight about, the one that's on the left-hand side is corporate performance improvement. Um, the other two large portions of our bid, larger portions of our business is our private equity services group um, and our restructuring and turnaround group. And actually that's the, that's the history of our firm. So we actually did start off as a restructuring and turnaround firm. And you, as you've done your research, you may have seen that or read about that. Um, again, we're well beyond that from our roots, but that is part of our roots. And it actually plays into not only our core values, but it plays into how we solution and how we go to market. So very important part of our history. Um, so if we want to move on. So within uh, corporate, uh, within uh, CPI, which is corporate performance improvement, we have a lot of different services that we uh, bring to the marketplace. Um, kind of when you step back at a very high level, we have corporate transformation where we're looking at uh, businesses in their entirety and how we can help them reinvent themselves or move uh, through disruption in the marketplace. There's never, well, I would say there's never been, but this is probably one of the most um, profound um, environments for business disruption, certainly in my business ten years, Scott, et cetera, even from some of us that have been around for a while. It, it's, it's, uh, it's significant, and our corp corporate transformation group is, is working with companies as they, they, they kind of marshal their resources and work through uh, what does COVID mean, what does post-COVID mean? Um, we also have technology services, which is a group that both Scott and I work through, um, where we, uh, we bring uh, different uh, services around technology, whether that's program management, uh, enterprise systems, evaluations, risk assessments on security, infrastructure, et cetera. Um, we have a large supply chain uh, um, practice um, where we're looking at every process, system, organizational structure, et cetera, in how you bring products to market. Um, and then the, there's obviously some other things here, growth in customer service was around uh, revenues. M&A is a big part of our practice. Uh, HCOC, which is our human capital organizational uh, change group, um, a lot of times they come in uh, as part of, uh, of another um, uh, service that we're providing, whether it's corporate transformation or supply chain. And then another organization that I'm actually part of, which is the CFO services, where we focus a lot on um, how does the finance and accounting organizations um, really support the business. Um, and and uh, there's a lot of, you know, whether it's SOX compliance or it's financial transformation, um, et cetera. So, uh, so it's a full service firm and we, we, we do have a lot that we offer. You know, the good thing about A&M is, is that as you come in as an analyst, um, depending on what business is coming in through the door, you will have the opportunity as a generalist coming into the firm to potentially have um, an opportunity to work on any one of these areas um, uh, as, you, as you join A&M. So next. So uh, our firm, on the, from the U.S. perspective, is divided into two regions. Um, we have an East region and a West region, um, and you can see how it's, it's split up. That doesn't mean that if there is opportunities and you have a particular skill set or we have a particular need that matches what you can bring to the market, that we, you won't work on East region jobs. I've done work on East region jobs, as, as many of the people on the, the phone have, but what... Um, but what we, we try to do is we try to staff within our region, um, principally from the perspective of we'd like to have people that are closer to home, not traveling, not on the road all the time, et cetera. But, um, but we are, uh, you know, we, we do divide into two regions. Um, so moving on.
Um, there's a couple of uh, large industry groups that we focus on. Um, our largest in the West region is energy. So our, the, the, the core, the, you know, the headquarters of our West region is actually in Houston. And so we do a tremendous amount in the gas and oil and energy business. Uh, we also have a large healthcare business. TMT, um, we do a lot of different work in, in that. There's one of the reasons I joined the firm was for TMT from my media and entertainment background. And we are working with some large uh, radio conglomerates, uh, television, movie studios, et cetera. Um, but we're also working with uh, some large SaaS providers um, and um, multi-channel uh, video uh, program distributors. Um, Social sector is another big part of our practice, uh, particularly in our Seattle office. We have a lot of uh, people that work in the social sector. And these are things like large foundations, like the Gates Foundation, et cetera. So uh, working in, in education, working for public sector in local uh, state uh, government agencies, et cetera. And then the last uh, core industry group we have is consumer products groups and industrials. Uh, this is where Ramin, who was going to join us, this is his, his uh, you know, where he, 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 he thrives and, and has a lot of experience. Um, and there, there's everything you could think of that's in your pantry, in your living room, um, in your car, in your garage. Um, we, we have people doing work in those businesses. Next. So as I said, we have about 4,000 people worldwide. Talked about this, that we're 35 years old and we have 50 offices. Um, you can see from this where we are located. Um, uh, we do have the opportunity, and I work very closely actually with the folks in London. Um, so we do have opportunities for international experience. Um, and, uh, but you know, that's not a requirement. That's not something, that's really something that you, you pursue. Um, but we are a global firm and we work with global companies. Um, and often we are collaborating and coordinating with our um, fellow consultants across the globe. Next. All right, so what makes A&M different? Okay, um, there's a couple of things. One is our core values. So they're listed here. Um, and I want to point out a few of them. Um, one of the ones that we've just recently added, and it's not that we didn't have this as a core value to begin with, because we had a lot of people working in this area and focused on it internally, but it's now become a stated core value, which means we're measured on it, and it's really, it, it's become important to the leadership of our company, and that's inclusive diversity. Um, so we're putting a lot of effort, um, both, uh, both money and time towards that. Um, so, you know, if you, if you look at the other firms that you're going to look at or other, even other co companies, um, out in the marketplace, you're going to have a lot that, that say, well, quality is a big, is an important thing for us. Um, objectivity is kind of unique to consulting. It's maybe even unique to us, not terribly unique, but, um, but where we try to bring fact-based objective solutions as opposed to shooting from the hip. Um, integrity is a huge part of this. But, you know, the one value I think that you probably don't see a lot of in when you look at corporate um, and companies and, and what makes us different is fun is one of our core values. And, you know, people have asked Tony and, and Brian – uh, Tony Alvarez and Brian Marcel, you know, how long are you going to do this? Because, you know, they got up in, up in years and they've, they've established this firm 35 years ago. And, you know, Tony's response is, I'm going to do it until it's not fun anymore. Um, so we love to have fun. Um, we, uh, we like to make our jobs fun. So we, we, we want to create an environment, a work environment where you're learning, you're producing you're giving value to your customers, but it's a fun experience. It's not, you don't feel like you're, you're, you're getting beaten down, et cetera. So very important to us and, and certainly part of our core values. Next. So 
So the other thing, a couple of other things that make us very different from other firms. Traditional consulting firm is shaped like a pyramid or a triangle, right? So you have a lot of people coming in at the analyst level, which is what you'll be interviewing for. And you work your way up, 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 up. And then eventually you get to the partner level, a managing director or partner level. Um, we have a very different staffing model. We actually staff that in the middle and it's more of a diamond shape. So the green diamond that you see. So what does that mean to you as an analyst? Okay, because that's really, you should be asking your questions. Okay, great, they're telling me about the firm, but how does it impact me if I'm coming into the firm? Well, here's what it means. What it means is that on any particular engagement, on most engagements, there are direct interactions between the consultant and the analyst and the partner, which is not, not something that uh, you normally see in a, in a large consulting firm. It's normally you report up hierarchically. Um, we bring in a, a, a limited number of people at the analyst level, more people at the manager and director level. Um, and we do this strategically because um, when we go to market and when we differentiate ourselves with our clients, we wanna say, well, we're not just throwing a bunch of um, you know, young people that don't have a lot of experience. We're bringing in very bright young people to support um, very experienced people. And so um, it benefits not just you as you come into the firm, but it also benefits our customers because we don't, you know, the way we staff is the way we resource our, our firm is the way we resource our jobs. Okay. The other uh, thing that, uh, that differentiates us is that if you were to say, Tell me how many of your consultants, especially at the senior level, um, how many of them are career consultants that may have had some industry experience, but for the most part, have spent most of their time in, in consulting. And how many of them are career operators who have now come over to consulting? You're going to get about 50-50. And what that dynamic does is it creates a real value add proposition for our customers. And it also creates a great opportunity for the people that are working in that environment because they get to see kind of two sides, two different perspectives. Um, when I work with Scott or I work with uh, my partner, Mark Stott or Ramin, um, they're bringing in a ton of consulting experience and a craft that they've developed over decades, right? I'm bringing in business experience, practical experience. I've been up there, I've rolled up my sleeves, I've sat in the seat of the people that we're talking to. And you combine those two, and it is very, very powerful. So if you, what is the difference between a and I think it's the way we staff, uh, both hierarchically, also between bringing in operators and career consultants and putting that together and creating something that really differentiates ourselves. Next. If that's, okay. So um, how are we a bit unique? Uh, so as we've said, uh, we are regionally staffed. So we do try to limit the amount of travel. So it's, we're not a national firm where you join and they say, okay, you're off to Boston every weekend from California um, and uh, you'll be on a plane five hours each way for the next eight weeks. Um, not out of the realm of possibility, but not standard. And so uh, we do try to staff, uh, you know, and, and limit the amount of travel as, as best as possible. Um, the other thing is, is we tend to have shorter duration projects. So we try to um, kind of put a, a, a fence around the services that we're going to provide for our customers. So your the standard um, the standard uh, project may be six or upwards of twelve weeks, as opposed to six to twelve months. And what that the benefit to you as a new analyst coming in is that you're going to see a lot of variety, and you're going to work with a lot of different people. 
Um, and that can only benefit you long-term on your career. Um, and, um, you know, th I would say the, the other thing that's, that's different and unique about us is that you have some, you have some consulting firms or some uh, firms that are out there servicing customers that are purely strategic. Um, they're going to come in, they're going to evaluate, and they're going to say, this is how you do it. Go hire somebody to do it. And then you have other firms that come in and say, hey, we're really low cost provider. We can do staff augmentation. We can, you know, help you, you know, fill gaps in your organization. What really makes A&M different, and I think part of this is because we have that combination of consultant and operator, is that um, we kind of, you know, we eat our own dog food, if you will. We, uh, we, we come up with a strategy and then we help you execute the strategy. And I think that's a real differentiator for us as well. Um, any questions so far on this? I don't know if they can put in the chat room or otherwise we can move on. I have a quick question. Um, so if it's okay, I would like to know, so I, I think, can, can you hear me okay? Is my I can, yeah. yeah. Gary, perfect. Okay, so because of your staffing model, you have industry experience, right, at a very high level, and then you have consultants working from the bottom up. What is your expectation for people who start as an analyst and as a consultant? Do you expect them to, at one point, you know, get more specialized industry experience, or do you expect them to, you know, just keep growing? That's a good question. So, um, so when you come in as an analyst, the expectation is is that you are a professional sponge. Okay. So we want you to learn as much as you can, go as broad as you can, see as see as see as much difference as you can, um, get as much experience as you can. And then the expectation is as you work through and figure out what's your passion, what do you like to do, what are you good at. You're gonna find you're gonna find your niche. You're gonna find your swim lane, and then you'll kind of narrow what you work on. Okay, but as an as an entry level person, we want you to get as as much diversity and experience as possible that we can deliver to you. So there's no expectation you're gonna be a specialist in anything, other than we expect you to work really hard, have fun, and be a professional sponge. Awesome, thank you. Uh, I have a quick question as well. Uh, going off of that, uh, how much control do we have over like the projects and industry we work on? Like for example, like going at, at an analyst level, if I wanted to explore more in like human capital and like the energy industry, would I be able to have like control over that or is the staffing kind of like random or by preference? Yeah, you won't have control over that. What you will have is influence over that. So mm -hmm. you can make your desires well known um, you will have direct uh, um, interactions with our staffing people. Um, and so that, you know, you can raise your hand and say, hey, this is Preston and you know, I want to I see oil and gas or I want to go into HCOC, et cetera. Um, we have to have a job. We have to have something for you to work on in that area for, you, for us to assign you to that. So, you know, it's, there's, there's a little bit of luck and, and involved in that. Um, but you can make your desires known. But, um, you know, the other thing I would say is, is that, you know, make, you know, whether it's this job or any job, you know, you should always make your desires known, but push yourself beyond your comfort levels. You're going to get assigned to a job that you didn't think you wanted, that you didn't think you were going to be good at, that you weren't comfortable taking. Um, embrace it. Work hard at it. You will, you will be surprised sometimes that that ends up being the passion that you work on. So, I think we are moving on. Sure, okay. I was just questions. Uh, add a finer point on on, on your comments, Ben. I, I think back to uh, what Ben was talking about earlier in terms of our scale. Right and, um, and and references to Tony and Brian. Right, we are we are um, the biggest little firm that you probably never heard of, and we're all on a first name basis with one another. So the in, your interaction with um, uh, the operations team, which is uh, the, the the group that would staff you uh, on on an assignment, uh, you're on a first name basis 
uh, with those people, right? We we are a, a family, and you'll see in the next in the next slides uh, that that's actually true. And uh, um, you know, if if you are um, if you are wanting to go into an organization and and just wanting to be a number as opposed to a, a first name, right? Um, that, that that's essentially the difference. Thanks, Chris. Okay, so um, so one of the other, like I pointed out in uh, at the very outset, um, inclusive diversity is really important to us, and we are spending a lot of time, effort, and money. And I think you need all of that. You need you need dedicated time from executive leadership. Okay, you need focus of the firm. And you need to invest. And we're doing all of that as it relates to our commitment to diversity and inclusion. Um, and so we have a number of different organizations, whether it's a and one which is our L LGBTQ organization, uh, the Women's Leadership Connection, our Young Professionals Organization, which, um, which uh, um, brings in the first and second year people and they, they get to have a dialogue with senior people about what's going on in the firm and understanding how the firm works, et cetera. Um, so, uh, so just know that you know, it's not lip service. I've worked with companies that said, yeah, we are a diversity program. Um, I've never felt it like this, not, not like this firm. So uh, understand that we are committed to it, so. and fun. So here is some great pictures. Um, you'll see like in the upper left hand side, you'll see Forrest right there in front with his daughter. Um, his second child is on the way. So we're, we're anxiously waiting that one. Um, but this was a party that we had at, at Chris's uh, house um, for a summer uh, barbecue. Um, and uh, the one lower middle kind of uh, it's a nighttime scene. That's our. That was our most recent Christmas party. But um, we do we do enjoy each other's company. So we do enjoy working together. But we enjoy each other as well. And and to me, that's you're going to spend a lot of time working. It's just a fact of life. You're going to spend a lot of time working, and you should should really enjoy not only what you're doing, but with whom you're doing it with. And so um, so I would encourage you to. You know, as you look at, you know, your opportunities of where you want to, you know, go and what jobs you want to pursue, um, make sure that you're choosing somebody where, you know, they seem to be having fun because it really is important. Next. That might be it for me. Oh, no, some more. Oh, and this is virtual fun. <laughs> so we've had a lot of virtual fun. So we've had... Um, Chris, where is your uh, cocktail party? There it is. So we have the, the, the Chris cocktail party, which I was a, I was a uh, happy participant in, as were my two, uh, my recent college graduate and my junior in college who uh, helped me consume the cocktails I was making. Um, we've had uh, all different kinds of cooking classes, etc. cetera. Um, and again, so we can't be physically together. Uh, that didn't, eliminate one of our core values. It's still part of our core values, it's part of our DNA, and we've just figured out how to do it virtually, so. So next, who is doing the day in the life? Thanks, Ben, I'm gonna take day in the life. All right, great, Natalie. Awesome. So as an analyst, um, this is just kind of a snapshot of what a day might look like. Um, it's a little different now that it's remote. So we've adjusted to um, reflect. And this, this is showing a project that I actually just completed, um, working with a team in San Francisco. And we were um, creating a business case and operating model for our records management client um, to present to the board to um, decide whether or not to shift their business to a SaaS model. So I usually start my days and like to get a quick workout in before work. Um, and then I will catch up on morning emails while I grab some breakfast and coffee. 
Um, this project in particular, our client was on the East Coast, so we started our days at 7.30, um, and we would, we would have stand-ups every morning to discuss just kind of the major act, action items for the day um, and what we wanted to, to get done that day. Um, at 8 a.m. today, I had a chief product evangelist meeting, and we were discussing the product roadmap and um, iterating on the vision for where we saw their, their product offering going. Um, at 9, we revised the slide deck and data set based on the feedback from that meeting before. And then at 11, um, we sent the slide deck out for the check-in with the CFO and the CEO later in the afternoon, um, making sure that was all clean and ready to go. Um, and then at 11.30, um, I grabbed lunch while on a call with the team um, on this call discussing the Trojan Talk and some of the other events that we've done on um, at USC. And then at 12.30, um, I went into the data set, our financial model, and reviewed the COGS R&D and GNA assumptions to make sure those were all locked down um, and that those were they're clean with what we had um, heard from the client in our meeting. And then um, bi-weekly, I have a performance management call with my performance manager, Morgan. Um, we were discussing the annual review process, which we actually just completed. Um, so we were going over what consensus was going to look like and what I could expect um, from my annual feedback. And then at 2 p.m., we had the, the progress update meeting with the CFO and the CEO. And then um, at 3, we took, we took whatever feedback we got from that meeting and incorporated it back into our financial model that I was working in earlier in the day. Um, finally, I called it a night and went and grabbed some dinner um, with some friends and then um, came back and just made sure there was nothing left for me to do, read my book, and head to sleep for the night. So this is a pretty good um, kind of average day in the life um, for, for me at least. Awesome. So um, we also wanted to talk about what some of the non-project work um, looks like at a and and the kind of things that we do as a firm to make sure that um, everybody is, is developing professionally and reaching the goals. So I mentioned um, a little bit in my day in the life the performance management call that I have. Um, and so before you even join the firm, you get um, matched with the performance manager and um, they are your overall coach, advocate, um, and just kind of guide in terms of setting your goals, um, how your reviews are going, um, and then they, they help and walk through the interim and annual reviews for you. Um, and so we have those calls. You get to decide the um, cadence of those, but um, I have calls biweekly, and we discuss what I've been working on, what kind of things I'm really enjoying or struggling with and um, how I want to take what I'm learning and apply it in the future. So it's a really great way for both her and I to constantly be thinking about where I'm at, how I'm doing and where I'm going. Um, so you constantly have that, that perspective um, and those conversations going on. So it's not just something that you visit once or twice a year. Um, it really is a continual effort. Um, and then for learning and development, um, we have a couple different formats for that. So um, learning and development really happens both formally and informally at A&M. Um, informally, obviously, through the project work that you're doing and the internal um, engagements you might be working on. Um, most of my best learning experiences have come just from learning from those around me and, and watching and soaking in. Um, kind of like Ben was saying earlier, being a professional sponge. Um, but outside of that, we definitely have lots of formal learning opportunities. So um, we have a full week of onboarding when you first join the firm, as well as consulting essentials courses. Um, so consulting essentials, Houston, all of the new hires would um, travel to Houston for a week and um, take class a week-long course um, that kind of introduced you to all the basics that you needed to perform well as an analyst. Um, it's moved online now, but it still is the same um, value that you get from that. And then 
throughout the year, you can take self-studies or um, moderated classes that, that help develop some of your core skills or train you on specific industries or solutions. And then we also have our annual a and University in Chicago. So that is an annual trip that's open to anybody. Um, and you can go to Chicago with all types of practitioners of any level from all over the country. And we meet up in Chicago and have a really fun week um, full of courses to take there. So you get to pick and choose things that are of interest to you that you really want to work on. Um, as far as mentorship and coaching, so we talked about the exposure to industry operators and career consultants. Um, like I said, some of my best learning opportunities um, and, and things that have really stuck with me have just been from being in a conference room with Ben, um, for example, or working with some of the other um, practitioners and just seeing the way that they do things and asking them questions. Um, it's also very common practice to schedule coffee chats or just 30 minute phone calls with um, whoever you want to in the firm and just pick their brain. Um, everyone is super open to that and it's a really great opportunity to get to know um, some people in the firm you haven't had the chance to work with yet or people that have specific experience that you're curious about. Um, in addition, you get assigned an onboarding buddy when you join the firm. So for example, um, Neha just joined the firm and I was her onboarding buddy, um, which is a great pleasure. And um, that is just your kind of go-to person to ask any questions for um, when you're first joining that you might be confused about or um, just kind of a good person to introduce you and welcome you to the firm. And then we've talked a little bit about staffing, um, but uh, just to kind of reiterate the point, so we have a staffing team that will listen to whatever preferences you have in terms of types of projects you want to work on or industries you're interested in, and they help you get experience in those um, um, opportunities. Um, we also have started doing what we call shadowing assignments. So when you first join the firm, this is kind of like um, live training you basically will get added to a project team and give the, given the opportunity to, to join that project team and um, contribute to the project and learn from um, the entire team um, and, and get exposure to different types of, of work um, and just kind of be, get oriented to how a project works, um, what, what um, casework is like and, and how um, deliverable um, you can expect to, to operate. Okay, thanks, Natalie. So, um, I, as I said uh, at, the, at the beginning, um, one, of, uh, one of the reasons why we do these Trojan Talks um, is uh, to uh, promote uh, the position for which we're recruiting, uh, which is a consulting analyst. Um, uh, this timeline here uh, represents uh, our activities, uh, you know, on virtual campus uh, this fall. Um, uh, with uh, this <clears throat> with this session, um, just following on the heels of the uh, uh, of the Marshall recruiter reception last week. Uh, we also, um, every year, um, uh, spend uh, time doing workshops with uh, the Marshall Women's Leadership Board. And as was also referenced um, uh, this year, uh, we, are, um, we are presenting a case um, uh, uh, in, in the uh, FBE Financial uh, Valuation and Analysis class, FBE 421. Um, I see a few, few faces from there. I see a few faces from the MRR. Um, you know, as Ben said, apologies for any uh, duplication of information, but um, what's, uh, what's, what's really actually more important um, over and above this information is the opportunity to interact with um, our, our candidates. So just uh, uh, real quick, if, if uh, we get an idea here of, um, uh, of the seniors in the room tonight, can you uh, uh, hit the uh, uh, thumbs up? button, the reaction button, um, and show, or, yeah, there we go, there we go. Excellent. 
excellent. Oh, excellent. Wow, the whole second page. Pretty much. All right. Did you get those, Natalie? <laughs> no, it's okay. All right. Um, excellent. So um, for for you seniors, um, uh, the, the position is posted on um, on both Handshake uh, for Marshall students, uh, as well as on Connect SC um, for uh, the rest of the campus. Uh, our application deadline is October 5th, which is a week from Monday. And uh, if if you've been following along, right? Um, you uh, sh you should be you should be get getting the distinct impression that um, that these personal interactions and knowing our people as people and not as numbers, right? These are very important uh, uh, elements of our recruiting process. And so, um, uh, while the application deadline is uh, not until a week from Monday. Um, the uh, the sooner that you get your application in, um, I can tell you that the greater the likelihood will be that uh, you will have additional opportunities to informally interact with other members of the recruiting team. Um, we do coffee chats um, uh, uh, for um, um, high potential applicants. So get your application in early. Uh, don't wait until the end uh, so that we can uh, have an opportunity to continue to the dialogue and get um, any, any more of your questions answered. Um, so our process will be that the application deadline is October 5th, uh, and then about a week later we will be uh, extending invitations to interview for first round, uh, followed by um, a, a final or second round um, just uh, two weeks later, sorry, a week later, excuse me. Um, and then we're looking to get um, uh, offers extended uh, before the end of October. That uh, date that's on the slide is actually just changed. It's actually the 29th now. But all of this is for uh, the consulting analyst position um, that starts in summer of 2021. Here are the, uh, the job IDs. Uh, again, for Marshall students, um, please apply on Handshake. And uh, for non-Marshall, you can um, uh, you can uh, apply on Connect SC. So that brings us to uh, what are your questions, um, uh, Forrest? Should I, I take down the uh, sharing here? Okay, did that Great. go ahead. I'll take it, pass it back to you. Yeah, thanks everyone. We're gonna go ahead and answer some questions and so we don't all talk over each other. If you have a question, if you could, could give me the thumbs up and, and leave it there and I'll, I'll go through and, and call on folks. So if anyone has a question, please give me a thumbs up and, and we'll go ahead and do that. Okay, uh, Larissa, can you go ahead and ask your question please? Yeah, hi, my name is Larissa. It's nice to meet you guys. Um, I wanted to ask a little bit more about the LA office uh, specifically. I know you guys mentioned that things are broken down by the West region, but I wanted to get a little bit of a better idea, maybe of the culture in the LA office specifically and how big the office is. So the yeah, sure. so, ben, do you want so to take that? we're actually relatively small in the LA office, or as we call it, the SoCal office. So the LA office has professionals that go as far north as Santa Clarita, where I live, and almost down to San Diego, uh, where um, uh, we have uh, a couple of our senior directors. So uh, we're fairly spread out in the LA office. Um, uh, that said, we don't really think of ourselves, I mean, the LA office is where we would meet and where we would have cultural things and where we would do some of our internal training, et cetera. Um, we, we really think our, of ourselves more as part of the West region, which is uh, much larger. And so, um, you know, there are people on this phone here who have worked for LA office partners. And there are people that have worked for partners in Houston and Denver and, um, and Dallas and San Antonio 
and San Francisco, et cetera. So um, you'll have the opportunity, um, you know, during the last seven months, um, everybody was working remotely. Uh, we actually have very, very few people in the field. Um, and that is, uh, that is not only just based on uh, statute within a state, but it's also based on our firm's position that the most important thing for us as partners is the health and welfare of our, our employees. So we, we actually did have clients that have requested us to go into the field uh, on some occasions uh, where it was not illegal. Um, actually, Forrest was one of those people who was working for me. And, um, and we met with the, the CFO and we said, listen, we've proved to you we can do this remotely. Um, there's no real reason for us to be physically present in Louisiana. And uh, because they were doing uh, an ERP uh, implementation there. And, um, and the thing went off without a hitch. It was completely successful. And it was so successful, we picked up an, the, the next uh, integration for that same company and will also be done fully remote. So, um, so, you know, I wouldn't get too hung up on LA. I would think more of what's the culture of A&M. Um, there's not a lot of difference between East and West other than we have different sets of clients and different specialties when it comes to industry. Um, but other than that, uh, you know, there's a, there's a lot of opportunities there. Yeah, thank you so much for answering that. And it's thank great you for to asking, Marissa. you guys were able to do the transition so well with COVID. Yeah. Great. Thanks, Larissa. Okay, Owen, uh, go ahead. Hey, how's it going? Uh, my name's Owen. Thank you guys for the presentation. Um, and it's nice to see some of you guys again. I was in Professor Plotz's class, so that went well. Um, my question is actually focused more towards some of the newer analysts, uh, like Natalie or anybody else. Um, I'm really interested, in, and I like a lot the uh, – you know, kind of what um, Ben touched on in terms of the structure of the company and how analysts are given the opportunity to, you know, work with partners and directors and it's very um, integrated. So how, how has that experience been for you guys? Um, what are the benefits of that for you guys? And, and how do you think um, that's helped you guys grow as, as consultants? Yeah, Great, Natalie, do you want to take that? I'll take that. No, Alex isn't on right now. Oh, oh okay. <laughs> um, yeah, so it's been really fantastic um, just watching them interact. And, um, you know, before we were remote, the, the way our projects work is where we work together in a big conference room and we're kind of sitting elbow to elbow with our, with our project team all day. Um, and so, you know, when we're drafting deliverables or thinking about like high level strategy of the project and where we want to go with it, it's really interesting to be part of those conversations and listen in on how a partner thinks and how they formulate their thoughts, um, both in, sh in terms of short term and long term strategy. Um, and so it's not just like, okay, we're going to go to this meeting and get this deliverable out. It's how are we going to position ourselves to be, uh, become a trusted partner with this client? Um, and, and how are we going to deliver beyond the value that they're expecting? Um, and so obviously kind of those, those more tactical, small skills definitely, um, are, are helpful to learn from them. But I think just the higher level strategy and, um, just kind of, um, how they think about the problems has been a really unique opportunity that I've been able to learn just from, just from working with them. Thank you so much. Yeah, no, that's that great. Your question, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Great. Thanks, Spencer. Go ahead. Uh, hey, guys. Thank you for your time today. Uh, so uh, two quick questions. I'm actually doing a master's program, a one-year master's program. Uh, I graduated in May from USC. I just wanted to make sure it was still appropriate for me to apply this, to this position. And then my second question is, can you guys explain the diversity of your team members in terms of like educational background? Uh, you know, I assume some of you are from business backgrounds, but maybe some are from STEM or liberal arts um, or other areas. Great, thanks. How about we have Baker take this one? I was already on the mute, on mute button there uh, for you, Boris, thanks. 
Um, so, uh, so there are two parts to that to that question. The first is um, your individual situation is uh, that you're a master's candidate, um, uh, and uh, and whether or not it's uh, appropriate to apply. Well, uh, what I can say is it's not inappropriate to apply. However, um, uh, first for starters, um, the position uh, does not begin until late summer 2021. So uh, that is uh, is typically a, uh, a a challenge for um, say like May you know May 20 uh, 20 grads um, um, uh, to you know have to wait that long. It's it's also can be a challenge for uh, for winter graduates as well. Uh, but undergraduates are the primary um, sort of uh, target applicants uh, that we're looking for because. Um, this is a, uh, a consulting analyst, which is our entry level role, and um, uh, our uh, uh, the, the, the next level up from analyst is consultant, and uh, we we typically hire in consultants from master's programs, and uh, uh, as well as those uh, that have had some uh, uh, work experience post undergraduate. So. Um, you know, I'm I'm uh, I'm not telling you that you are uh, completely ineligible, but um, it's probably not um, the right uh, alignment of stars um, because the, the 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 level of the of the role is um, uh, is not appropriate for where you're at in your in your education. Does that make sense? Yes. Thank you. Okay. And the second part. What was the second part? Oh yeah, um, yeah. We used to have a slide in the stack, um, Ben. You might remember it's, uh, you know, it, it's sort of like a, it's, it's a graph, uh, and it's got a straight line going from the lower left up to the upper right, and uh, it's the, it, it represents, you know, the myth of, um, uh, you know, uh, career consultants or or or, or seasoned. Uh, industry operator consultants like Ben, um, that it's a myth that um, uh, you know uh, that the um, you know that the major that you had in undergrad and that you know it was an MBA with this kind of emphasis and then this kind of working experience and this, it's the reality is all of us take completely circuitous paths um, and there there is no sort of one. Um, one way uh, to go. I myself um, am uh, a Dornsife grad, I was an English major, um, and I went into IT right out of school. Um, what I didn't know then that I now appreciate is the value of that, uh, of that uh, liberal arts and uh, English language education because it has been indispensable in terms of my ability to, uh, to do what what IT people have to do, which is translate technical concepts to business concepts and vice versa, right? Um, you know, I've uh, had the pleasure of working with, you know, many, many brilliant programmers, but they don't necessarily have the same skill set to be able to do um, a, a, a pitch or a proposal or, a, you know, to, to, to convince, you know, uh, a granting committee for, you know, funding, that kind of thing. So, um, I, you know, Ben, maybe uh, I, I know you uh, like to call yourself a recovering CIA or CFO. Um, uh, I'm a recovering CPA. Yeah. Uh, um, recovering CPA. Yeah. yeah maybe. I, you know, I would say, you know, traditionally, uh, you know, the vast majority of our analysts coming in will have uh, will have a business background because we are business consultants. But um, that's not to say that we haven't hired people of other disciplines. Who have been extraordinarily successful. So don't let that prevent you from applying. Yeah, I would Ben just to add, I think, you know, individuals that have majored in economics or the like, I think, you know, what we look for is even if it's someone's in a traditional liberal arts program that they've peppered in enough, you know, statistics and quantitative coursework, ideally basic accounting. So I, I wouldn't uh, you know, I know we, 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 you know, USC has a business school, UCLA, for example, doesn't, right? So we, we would recruit there for 
typically economics majors, but those that have demonstrated quantitative skills and have taken some classes in, you know, in, in business statistics, accounting, um, you know, think things along the, those lines. So I think it would be less, again, about the degree in the sense it's more, have you taken, you major in philosophy and never taken econ, never taken anything quantitative, that would probably be a stretch. But if you majored in, in uh, you know, let's say you had a minor, a double major and taken some of those quant classes, then we would still, uh, I think we'd still consider that relevant. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. Ben, Scott. Great. Thanks. Uh, Mitchell, go ahead, please. Hi, yeah. Thanks for having us today. Um, my question was more to do with like a long-term career at AM. Um, because I know that that diamond shape, it seems like there's a lot of external hires from um, like outside industries. I was curious if um, promotion is like a structured path or whether it's based off of uh, openings in the in the tier above and then what like starting as a sure. first year analyst what the next 10 years would look like uh, as a starting full time great Scott do you want to take that question yeah absolutely so I think you can answer from an industry standpoint because you're all exploring this and we want to make sure that it's a combination of what we're talking about but also be good coaches and the like. Um, I think that, you know, analysts traditionally have worked for two to four years and there's a, a significant number that would go on to business school, you know, or go on to something else. So that's not uncommon. I think you'll find that when you talk to other firms. That being said, we don't have a hard and fast rule. Some firms, that rule is very hard and fast. You know, you spend, and that's true in investment banking as well. There's always a small percentage of people that might pass over and, and get offered a, you know, kind of that next tier pre MBA or post MBA job. That's not true at AM. We, and, that, and that's true in general. Um, so I think we promote people on merit. We move people through the process from analyst to consultant based on their experience and their performance. And to the extent someone, you know, continued on that career path, we would not mandate that they go back to business school. They, they could continue and move, you know, move through the process based on the merits of their work. That being said, you know, it's not uncommon as you probably, you know, are learning as you explore things for people to do that, but it's not binary here. We don't have a hard and fast, you know, you're here as an analyst for three years and you have no choice but to go to business school. Um, yeah, and, again. and just the law of numbers, um, you're starting out with a lower base of people that are coming in at an analyst role. We have more managers and directors within the firm. And so mathematically, it's not like we hire in all the managers and directors. Most, a lot of those managers and directors were analysts and then became consultants, et cetera. So um, unlike a kind of a pyramidal kind of hierarchical, you know, you're either you're out or you're up, um, you know, in, in our, in our uh, practice, you're up if you're performing. And there's, there's opportunity because of that staffing model. Now, once you get to the, and it does become, you know, it becomes increasingly more difficult to get to the next level once you get beyond, you know, manager to director, senior director, managing director. Uh, but you would expect that. Um, but at, at the lower levels, uh, there'll be opportunities to move up. Absolutely. Sounds good. Thank you so much. Thanks. Um, Kaden, do you want to go ahead? Yeah, so um, my question is for Neha. Um, considering that, you know, a lot of us might be onboarded in a virtual environment, I was just curious what your onboarding experience has been like and if you can sort of speak to maybe some of the challenges and also like successes um, of your experience. Yeah, of course. Um, I'd love to. So, um, you know, it's no shock that it, I was a little skeptical before being onboarded. Um, but I would say that the onboarding process, um, A&M has been doing this since March. And so um, they've really refined the process. Um, and I was actually, you know, it ran really smooth. Um, you sort of, the first month or so, you're doing a lot of trainings and just getting associated with the different business lines that a has. Um, and, 
you know, you're taking that time to just kind of get your bearings. Um, and then like Natalie mentioned, you have an opportunity to get, you know, put on a shadowing engagement um, and also do some networking with um, within the firm. Um, so that has also been something that I've been spending a lot of time doing um, as I'm, I'm currently, you know, juggling a shadowing project, but then also doing some um, networking. Um, and, you know, it's really easy to reach out to people from different offices. I've, I've talked to people from, you know, the Seattle office, the Houston office, um, and of course, you know, people in the LA office. Awesome. Thank you. That's, that's great to hear. Okay. Thanks. Christian, do you want yeah, to go ahead? Yeah, definitely. Thank you so much. First of all, I want to thank all of you guys for taking time um, to chat with us. I really, really appreciate it. Um, and my question is, I know, Ben, you mentioned in the presentation that you've started, you obviously included diversity and inclusion as one of the core values. Um, and now it's a measurable part of, of A&M. And I'm, I'm just curious in general, how does A&M measure success in terms of the core values? On a, are you talking about on an individual basis or across the firm itself? Um, I guess I, either or, but I guess yeah, I mean, across so, the so firm, because um, it's as a whole, like how, yeah, how like do you measure? Um, I, I would say that, you know, the best way that, that you measure it is, um, you know, is your, is your firm uh, recognized for being uh, diverse? Um, and are individuals measured on their contribution to diversity? Um, you know, when we, when we go, as Natalie just said, you know, she just met with uh, Morgan to go through her performance review. And uh, when we go through our performance review for the year, um, you know, we do spend a, quite a bit of time focusing on, you know, what did you contribute to the firm from an economic perspective? You know, were you, were you contributing to jobs? Um, were you working hard? Um, did you demonstrate skills that we were able to leverage and, and bill, um, et cetera? So there's, a, there's an economic component to it. But we also have a very lengthy portion of it and a, and a long discussion about what was your contribution to the culture of the firm? Um, and that's, that's also very important to us. So it's, it's actually measured, um, it's measured on every job. It's measured annually on an individual basis. And to me, if you want to change or, or enhance your culture and move it in a, in a particular direction, there's a couple of things you have to do. One is you have, you need leadership from the top and we get, we get, messages from Tony and Brian and Tom Elsenbrook, who runs our CPI practice, et cetera, um, who make it very clear that this is, this is important to us. And the interesting thing is we've had a lot of, we, we have a lot of guest speakers. I was just, um, I just participated in one this week um, with, uh, oh God, I'm gonna forget her name. She is a former WMB, well, she's a current WNBA player. She played for uh, UConn national team, et cetera. She was, uh, she opted out of playing for the, MB, the WNBA to, uh, to do more work for social justice, et cetera. And she, it was national news. She came and spoke to us and she spoke to us about allyship, about, you know, you know at the end of the day, whatever group you're in, you need allies. And, uh, and it was really powerful to, to hear her say, you know, in, in her words, you know, we as, as black professionals can't change the whole thing. We need white people to help us. And that was her words. And, and what she was talking about is allyship. About, and when you're getting that message consistently, and we have so many opportunities in our firm to get that, to me, that's how you measure it. Because because you're putting your, your money where your mouth is, you're investing in that type of training, you're, it's coming from the top down, and you're measuring people and discussing it, you know, and making it part of their performance. 
And if you want to change the culture of a, of a company, measure it. Okay. And so from my perspective, you know, you know, we are recognized and I think there are some outside entities that do measure us and, and give us a rating, blah, blah, blah. But the fact that we measure our own employees to me tells us that we're moving in the right direction. Absolutely. That's really right. And I guess as a quick, quick follow up um, in terms of culture and core values, I'm curious from uh, anyone at a and um, what is your favorite fun thing you have done as a part of the a and family? Yeah, let's, let's have James go ahead and answer that. For sure. So I think one of the uh, more memorable events that we had was we did um, this escape room together as a team. And uh, we, I think there was like two groups of us in the office who were super competitive about, you know, how much time we spent in there getting out. And uh, it was just really interesting seeing people using their problem solving skills, but in a kind of different setting. So I really like that. Yeah. Imagine, imagine, you know, 20 plus consultants being super competitive. <laughs> Locked, unlocked in a, in a room trying to solve a puzzle. Yep. <laughs> awesome. Thank you guys so much. Great. Thanks. Abraham, do you want to go ahead? Yes, thank you. Um, it's nice to see everyone here. Thank you for coming. And uh, I'm James again after a meeting from Marshall Peter's reception. Um, I have a question regarding the way um, we're uh, AM is being staffed between a split 50% of career operators and, as I mentioned before, and 50% um, career consultants. Um, how has that given an edge for AM and uh, against other competitors within the industry? Okay. I'll ben, give an example. Yeah, I'll give an example. I'm going to ask Scott to give an example as well. So um, we uh, we recently were working with a, um, a consumer products company who also had kind of brick and mortar stores and and services associated with their with their goods with their products. Um, they uh, they had spent a lot of money on commercial advertising across a, you know a, a breadth of television networks. Um, uh, and the problem was they spent all the money in January and February. And of course their brick and mortar was, was shut down in March. And so they didn't get the return on investment and, and they were going through some challenging financial times, as you might imagine. And so, um, they brought me in because I used to sell advertising and I knew the heads of sales at, um, at at least a half a dozen of the networks and, and many of the others who I could either reference a second or third relationship. Oh yeah, I worked with Frank or I work with this guy. And we went in and we negotiated 28 separate deals with each of the networks to negotiate down the, the cost of that advertising because of the lost value to our clients, um, principally to keep them in business so that they could then uh, take that money that we save them and then reinvest it in future advertising on television shows starting um, actually this month. And so that's, that's where um, having somebody who's had that industry experience who come in with some practical relationships and, and, and really is, you know, they, that sat in the seat of the head sales guy or the CFO, et cetera, and have those conversations has worked. Now I partnered with, um, a really, uh, a really um, sharp director who was on top of it from a consulting perspective and helped us, helped us put together um, a working model of, I mean, think about it, negotiating 28 separate deals simultaneously. There's a lot of moving pieces. Each one is unique. Each deal is unique, but you, you couldn't, you, you had certain parameters that, that in total you couldn't violate. And so my director set up this great model of how we were going to keep track of that. So I was doing the negotiations. He was tracking it all. That's how it works together. So Scott, I'm sure you have great examples as well. It's, it's interesting having been in consulting with firms that were, you know, uh, BCG like firms, Ernst and Young, that were very different from that. Um, what we've done, I, I think there's a couple of places where it plays uh, very well, you know, private equity, which is a big part of our business. We're talking about the consulting business, but many that probably almost all of the people on this team have worked 
for or around a private equity client because we collaborate with the other business units and that's a big part of what we do. And private equity firms, as you'll learn, you are, are really not about studying things aggressively. They, you know, they buy something, they have very aggressive target returns, they move quickly. And so you know, having the capability to bring in operators in environments like that and, and kind of spin up projects quickly and have people really get to hypotheses much, much faster than perhaps if we were studying things and even things I've done in my past is, is very different for firms I've worked on. And then on top of it, we do a lot of interim roles. And I just actually three weeks ago finished being an interim CEO for a private equity backed payments processor in Dallas. I never actually made it to Dallas because I started the job around COVID, pivoted the company 100% virtually, ran the business for seven months in a virtual environment, Dallas-based company. And you know, I've worked most of my career, I've worked for CEOs because most of my work has been corporate strategy. I've been a nonprofit CEO, but I've never been a for-profit CEO. So that's a pretty unique opportunity, not only to do the work and collaborate with people like Ben, who have really strong industry experience and accelerate projects, but also, you know, and this is, you know, not something that's necessarily at the analyst level, but we've had directors and um, senior directors take interim roles in supply chain and sourcing and procurement, maybe not CEO roles, but that's a very unique thing. And, and often what happens is I had a manager, you know, so just a few levels above Anna, so was my chief of staff. So he got to be basically a CEO for a private equity company working with me. Uh, that's something that I never would have seen either when I was a you know, more junior person in consulting or even frankly in my prior consulting firm, the opportunity to be a CEO. So that's a very, even, even for me, that's a tremendously unique opportunity deep in my career that would not be available at most consulting firms. Thank you for sharing that and also for sharing, especially for Ben, your own experience being both a career operator and now a consultant. So appreciate it guys. Thanks. Aiden, do you want to go ahead? Yeah, sure. Hey, everyone. My name is Aiden Cusack, and I'm a senior at USC. And so I'm majoring in business administration, but I also have a minor in computer programming. So I have a strong interest in tech. And I'm just curious as to what, if any, role do emerging technologies play in A&M's client solutions, given that it's a business consultancy? Yeah, I'll go ahead and we'll go with Scott, Scott and Ben again on this one. But Scott, I don't know if you want to start. Sure. Um, I think so. You know, one thing is is interesting about AM. So we're not a systems integrator. And, and there's, you know, pros and cons to that. We've, we've kind of taken the position that we aren't, you know, that there's a very different margin profile for systems integration work. So we've stayed at the, what I would call a strategic technology strategy level of consulting, you know, probably more like what BCG and Bain and McKinsey would do on the technology side versus what a Cognizant or an Accenture would do. Um, that being said, you know, so much of the change that I'm sure you're seeing that in school is driven by technology. So I'd say the vast majority of projects we work on have a technology component. Right now, I'm actually working on a project where we're helping a, a company stand up a consumer finance platform and we're looking, you know, one of the things we're doing is looking at next generation fintech players. We're looking, there, there are established players and banks and lenders in this space, but this client is looking to push the envelope on innovation. And so, you know, we're spending a fair amount of time in the venture community looking at next generation technologies. I'm working to support a, a team that's working for the state of Texas on how they use AI and machine learning. It's actually the higher education uh, part of, of Texas and looking at, you know, how they can be more sophisticated and tracking all sorts of things around higher ed. And, you know, I, I served on a board of a venture backed machine learning company that's based out of MIT. And so we're working with them to think through, you know, what are some of the next generation technology and the like. So we're, we're more, we're doing that more work at more of a strategic level than, um, you know, than say an integrator, but technology increasingly is, is obviously critical to everything we do. Um, so it's, uh, it's just a different model. We're doing less of the build work and more of the think work. And quite often we're, we're program managing disparate technology vendors and making sure that they come together 
in an efficient and and and, and often we're re, re, uh, remediating broken technology projects. And where those are early stage companies or traditional players, um, it's something do quite often. Kind of living a little bit between the C suite and the uh, technology providers. So, um, the, you know, the, the kind of the subtle difference. And I'm going to let Ben weigh in, particularly given he's been a CIO, is that. We're uh, technology is critical to everything we do, understanding the ecosystem, the landscape. We're just not always building things like an integrator. But Ben, I don't know what you're saying. I mean, it, almost everything I've done recently has a technology component. We're just coming at it from a, a little bit more of a strategic or a remediation standpoint. Yeah. So, you know, one of the things that if you talk to most, uh, most CEOs, they will tell you that um, every company is a technology company. Okay, from just think of it, just think of any industry, there's a, it's no longer tech, technology is no longer back office and some kind of enabler. It's actually generally part of your product, whether it's part of the services, et cetera. And so, um, so, you know, we have, we do have a unique um, business proposition in the marketplace. As, as Scott has said, we don't, we don't do system integration. We actually have no strategic alliances. So what does that mean? It means that we're objective. And so remember that one of our core values is objectivity. And we're not tied to a particular solution. That's not to say we don't understand them. So we've had meetings, you talk about um, RPA, uh, uh, ro robotic process automation. And there's two, the, the two big players are Blue Prism and UiPath. And we've had them both in to educate us and to, to tell us about their products and how they're implemented and what the benefits are and, some of the, they give us stories about how, you know, some of the success stories, et cetera. Why do we do that? Because we're gonna be working with companies who don't know what the answer is, but they bring us in, they say, we need to reinvent ourselves, or we need to figure out how to change our cost structure, or we need to figure out how to accelerate growth, or we need, you know, or we need to, to react to some, you know, profound market disruption. And technology is a is a big part of that, and so we we do we do spend a lot of time educating ourselves on what's in the marketplace, so that we can bring the different solutions, help our clients pick a solution. So we will actually go through and work with our clients to do vendor selection, product selection, etc. We just we don't advocate a particular product, um, we don't implement a particular product, but what we do do is, you know, we will say okay. We'll help you not only pick a product, but we'll also help you program manage. We'll help you um, do the organizational change, the process change, which by the way, I, as a former CIO, doing the process change and the organization change is generally multiples more difficult than actually implementing the technology, okay? And so, in fact, most technology uh, projects fail, not because the technology failed, but because the business failed, because the process didn't change, because they didn't, because they didn't know how to leverage it and how to, how to, uh, how to carve out and hive out old process and say, we're going to, we're not going to do this anymore. And so, um, so that's where we play. That's, that's, uh, that's our playground right there. But we, we do a ton of tech work. In fact, most of the work I did in the past six months is on the technology side. Okay, awesome. Thank you so much for all that information. Really appreciate it. Thanks, Cameron. Do you want to go ahead? Hi, uh, my name is Cameron. I'm a senior studying business administration at Marshall. Um, I have two questions. My first one is more for the analysts. So uh, Ben was talking about how your projects are generally shorter than most uh, other consulting firms. And I just wanted to see from an analyst's perspective how that has sort of changed your experience being there and uh, how it's affected like the amount of exposure you get to different industries. Natalie, do you wanna go ahead? Sure, Cameron, you kind of alluded to my answer in your question um, and that is um, the benefit of having shorter term projects is, is really just the variety of exposure you get. Um, and so um, just in my one year at a and I, I think I've worked on probably seven projects maybe. 
um, and that doesn't even count the the proposals I've helped partners with or um, other internal engagement projects. Um, and so each project has been different, whether it's a different service we're going in to perform or a different industry that we get to go in and learn about. Um, and it makes it really interesting. Um, and it, it keeps that learning curve very near and dear. <laughs> Natalie, I have to jump in. How, how long had you been with the firm when you uh, showed up on our client in Portland? About two weeks. So I have to give Natalie some uh, some props because Natalie is two weeks into a job. She worked on a project that Ramin and I were managing up in Portland. It was a supply chain business transformation project. And I think maybe the third day in, she was in the boardroom with the executive, uh, executive committee, which is not at least not the way I grew up in consulting what you did two weeks in. And I think maybe three weeks in, she flipped some slides. So, um, you know, that's, I, I'm, having been, you know, kind of come up through consulting and done a lot of analyst recruiting, watched a lot of, that, that was not the traditional analyst role in most firms. And I, I say that only because that is not uncommon here. I, I think one of the things I've observed, I've only been here three years, is that you know pound for pound we put our analysts out there in client facing roles you know, proportionally you know much more than many firms do at, a, at an early stage in their careers i mean it's not uncommon for am, analysts and this would be true for investment banks to be fairly compartmentalized and not not let out i think i was chained to a desk for my first few years and and wasn't let out much but you know natalie's a kind of a tribute to how we how we engage and leverage our analysts and also how to some extent how collaborative and flat we are when we run teams. You know, we run teams by roles, not by hierarchy. Obviously Ben and I and the managing directors have to play a client facing role, a relationship role, but it's, it's a fairly unique opportunity here um, to, to be client facing and to do things that, that probably are, you know, in some senses above the, the traditional time and grade of, a, of an analyst in, in the industry in general. Yeah, I'll never forget um, the COO looking at me and less than a month into the job and, and asking kind of what my observations were <laughs> in the first couple of weeks and, and what I kind of was recommending that we dig deeper on. Um, it took every ounce of self-control for my eyes not to pop out of my head. <laughs> Fortunately, I didn't tell her that she didn't have email or a laptop. I'm just kidding, but it was, uh, it was pretty funny. Yeah, I, I thought that was awesome. Like, who are you? What do you think? Thank you. That's awesome. Okay, thanks. Preston, you want to go ahead? Uh, yes, Ashley just answered the exact question that I had, but uh, I guess going off of that question, I was going to ask, like, uh, because you guys are switching industries so quickly, I uh, say, uh, is it sometimes difficult for you to like get up to speed with all the information and like all the terms that are niche to that type of industry? Yeah, let's go ahead and have James answer that question. Do we have James with us still? I'm happy to take it for us if you want. Nope. Okay. Unless you want to take it, why don't you take it, you take sure. it for Go us? Ahead, Scott. No. Swing the bat. <laughs> sure, I'll go ahead. I'm just dishing them out. But yeah, no, it, it absolutely can be. Uh, you know, it's interesting. Ben said you have to be like a professional sponge your first year, you know, in your first few years. But I'd say that kind of continues. Uh, probably all the way through your career and even hearing Scott's story about kind of being a first time for profit CEO, you know, he's, he's had a, a really long, long successful career and, and he's st still doing new things. So um, I've been on a variety of different industries and functions. And so I, I think that's one of the really neat things about consulting is that you, you get to, to continue learning. You're never bored. Right. Um, and yeah, you do have to go and, and learn that all the terms and the acronyms and the, the different business models. So I think it's part of it. And one of the great things about A&M is there are so many folks that are, that are experts across the firm and we have such a big firm, you know, sometimes getting up to speed on a new project is having two or three internal calls with, with A&M folks that are experts in the industry. 
uh, and you know they're happy to do that and and uh, really get your hands dirty. So um, absolutely, I, I think you're a, you're a lifelong learner if you're uh, in consulting. So I, I think it's one of the benefits of of being in consulting and something that uh, almost all of us really enjoy. Thank you so much. Yeah. Eduardo, do you want to go ahead? Yes, yes, yes. Thank you very much. And again, I just want to echo, thank you to everyone on the panel uh, for the very engaging talk. And my question is, what are some of the challenges that the CPI unit faces, like, you know, as opposed to other different units, given that you're working with corporate transformation, right? Or if it's like a, a merger and acquisition, you're dealing with, you know, having to like strategize the synergies between different acquisitions. Like, what are some of the challenges that you face with maybe clients and trying to recommend or yes, what are some of the challenges that CPI faces? I think, I think one, of the, one of the challenges that we come across is that we will service almost every industry. And so you have to very, you have to very quickly come up to speed on the nuances of a particular industry uh, and make it your own. And, you know, I, I have, you know, decades of experience in media and entertainment at NBC, at Fox, et cetera. Uh, my first job uh, when I joined A&M was a food distribution company uh, based in Carlsbad. Actually, it's a company that, um, that Forrest is now uh, working on for me. Uh, it was part of a private equity deal where they aggregated a bunch of these. Um, and so I, be, you know, quickly became um, uh, an expert on the distribution of food to both schools and prisons and the nuances of how you, you have to package prison food in a very particular way so that it doesn't create a risk to the prison personnel. So things like uh, Kool-Aid cannot have coloring, it has to be clear so that there's nothing in the bottle. Um, and, uh, and, and uh, you know, the funny story we always share with that one was we got it, we actually had a tasting of the prison food while we were doing a job. And the CEO came to me and he said, so what do you think? And I said, well, you got prison food and you got school food. I said, if you want to lower the prison population, serve the prison food in the schools. <laughs> so, so you're going to, to me, I think, it's both a challenge and opportunity and really what makes it exciting and, and fulfilling is you're going to come across problems you may never have seen before in industries you have no experience in. But what you find is there are, there are solutions that are kind of ubiquitous. They, like when you start looking at the data, and that's really what, what we try to do, we try to look objectively at the data. We gather that and we, we do our homework and we do our study before we go in. You will find that you become very effective because simple solutions can go across multiple industries. Great story, when I was in undergrad, um, I had a marketing teacher and talking about Ray Kroc and how when Ray Kroc started McDonald's, um, they got to a point where the food the quality of food went out the window. They couldn't keep up with the volume, et cetera. And so Ray had to, he had to figure out, well, how do I make fast food, you know, work? And so he went and he studied emergency room triage. And he used the principles of emergency room triage in a dining room, you know, in a, in a, in a restaurant to figure out how to, how to solve a problem in fast food. So one of the things you will find is as challenging and as crazy as it gets, you're going to find that you do have experience or you, the partners or the directors, senior directors that you're working with are going to impart experience that they have to solve problems um, across multiple industries. But it is a challenge. Thank you very much. Okay, great. Thanks, everyone. I know uh, we're, we've been at it for about an hour and a half. What, what I'm going to do is we'll take one more question um, from someone we haven't heard from. I, I tried to, to not do any repeats and, and give everyone a shot. 
Um, and then I'll stick around and, and anyone else that, that wants to can, and I'll continue answering questions, but, but want to break as a group um, since we've been here for about an hour and a half. But Jessica, I know we haven't had a chance to hear from you today. So if you want to go ahead uh, and do our last group question, that'd be great. Um, hi guys. I first want to just thank you guys all for taking the time to be here and share with us a little more about um, your mission and all that you guys are doing. Uh, I had two quick questions. The first being, um, I'm currently a junior and was wondering if you guys are having any summer internship opportunities. Um, and the second question was, I'm very passionate about the social impact uh, field and have had the opportunity to work with a couple different nonprofits and was just curious if I could hear from anyone if you had any cases that you found interesting in that sphere as I have not seen a lot of consulting firms that have that as a um, individual sector. So I thought that was really cool. First, I'm happy to take that. Great. If you want. Sure. So uh, we're yep, not great. doing internships this year for juniors, um, but we high, highly encourage people to stay connected as you are because it's crazy how quickly the next year and, and not surprisingly, we, it, we, we take interest and notice of juniors that are you know, paying attention to us. So it's, it's, I would say that's true for all firms. So I would highly encourage all juniors to network as aggressively as you can, because, you know, we take notes, we look who's tracking us. I, I would stalk us um, as, as thoughtfully as, as you can. And I would recommend you do that to other firms as well, to the extent they, they may or may not offer internships, particularly in this COVID world. I think probably things are a little bit more dynamic than traditionally. On the nonprofit space, or the not so much the we have a very strong public sector practice that's growing. We've invested heavily. We actually hired the head of Accenture's public sector practice about a year ago, and we're doing you know some just fascinating work. Uh, much of that's disclosed in the public sector. Some is you know we're working for two of the larger states around COVID readiness and you know how they prepare and manage COVID on. One extreme, the Gates Foundation, this is, this is public, the Gates Foundation is one of our clients. I've been fortunate enough to, to kind of be humbled by setting foot in the Gates Foundation. The work that I've been doing there is around financial inclusion and fintech in, in Africa and other countries. That's one of uh, four of Gates Foundation's initiatives, but we also have done things in around healthcare. Um, we've done a number of work for foundations. And so that that practice, I mean, that's you know, that's a piece of things. So, but, but clearly in the West, because of our exposure to Gates and the fact that we have several managing directors that are very strong in the public sector, social sector practice, um, you know, we've done work, as James will tell you, for universities. We've done work for public sector entities. We've done work in and around healthcare. Um, and then we've done a number of, you know, the Gates Foundation, I think is a, you know, decade long relationship we have across a whole myriad of things that they're, focused on. So there's clearly uh, in the West, probably more so than the East opportunities to work in and around, you know, social sector, public sector, uh, innovation centric things in and around social services, uh, public sector, healthcare, and, 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 and things that are, you know, that the foundations are focused on. Thank you so much. And as a neuroscience major, I also find the healthcare work you're discussing very fascinating. So thank you. Yeah, we have a strong, just as a side note, we have a strong healthcare practice and, and, and several, quite a few of the people on this team have worked in and around the healthcare practice. That's both on, and a lot of that's on the provider side, um, you know, so getting pretty deep into, you know, the, the kind of innovation around healthcare. And actually one of my colleagues is the uh, interim CEO for Kaiser for the Western U.S. So, you know, there's a lot of opportunities in and around healthcare, particularly at the more, uh, the more junior levels because we cross staff and uh, create leverage into those other business units. Okay, great. Thanks so much, everyone. Um, we're going to go ahead and, and break now. Uh, I'm I'm going to stick around. So if anyone has more questions, you're feel free to stick around. I'm happy to answer them. But no one on either the A and M side or or the USC side should feel like they have to stick around. Um, so I just I want to make sure that uh, we get questions answered. But um, thank you all. Really appreciate you all. Yes, coming thanks. Tonight. Thanks for everybody yeah. spending time with us. Yeah, thanks everybody. Great to, great to meet everybody in this crazy virtual world. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to all the presenters. Thank you. I had a question. 
Oh, sorry. Who are we keeping after class for us? <laughs> <laughs> Whoever wants to stay, we, we, yeah, we're, we're happy to. What is the, uh, the best point of contact for you? Like, can you drop an email in the chat uh, for us? Just so we have someone to move on to. Sure. Absolutely. Baker will go ahead and do that. The best path is, is, is actually through LinkedIn. Um, and um, even better than that, if you're a senior and you're uh, interested in applying for the role, um, that should be your first point of entry. Um, because uh, it's, it's the submission of the application that engages my whole recruiting team uh, to, to start engaging you. So, um, but you can, you can feel free um to uh to send a linkedin invitation to any of the people that were on um uh, presenting today okay and i'll put my uh linkedin uh short url here in the uh in the chat thank you very much have a great day yep thanks Cameron. Yeah, i had a quick question uh, i know that the uh, topic of intern management up a little bit earlier in the presentation and i just wanted um, who were uh, who, who in the firm are able to access that opportunity? Do you have to be like a certain level in order to do so? You, you kind of cut out your first the first part of what you said, so I, I wasn't able to follow. Could you repeat that, Cody? I'm yeah. sorry. Yeah, no worries. Um, I was just wondering who in the firm is able to participate in intern management positions, and you know what other factors contribute to someone's eligibility for that. Yeah, it's um, it's uh, it, it's a fairly common um, uh, engagement type of engagement um, for, uh, for for the MDs and sometimes, but rarely, uh, the senior directors. It's, it's typically um, uh, our clients uh, would uh, want you know the most seasoned, um, uh, experienced person. Um, and that's typically uh, would 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 be a managing director. Okay, great. Thanks a lot. Hey, uh, I had so I'm Carl Voris. Thank you guys both for taking the time for this. It was a great presentation. I had Chris. I had a question more directly for Chris. Uh, so I also am a Dornsife student, and I have noticed uh, throughout the consulting world. I'm sure as you do. Uh, certain certain firms do place an emphasis on taking business students, and certain firms definitely shy away from taking non-business students. I was just wondering, how have you found an effective way to market yourself as somebody who's able to do the work that a consultant is able to do, but you don't have that business background that maybe connects with an interviewer who did have a business background, but that's what they're looking for? What would you focus on? Baker, you're on mute. <laughs> I'll answer this first yeah. about how AM and approaches that topic, um, and then sort of my own story, and, and, and see if we get to uh, the, the nature of your question. So, um, you know, AM, uh, as Ben was saying earlier, um, you know, we are looking for um, generalists. We are looking for a jack of all trades, right? Um, and so, um, you know, whether you're talking about uh, a, a, a field of study for a major um, or you're talking about, um, uh, you know, um, a specialized certification, um, uh, say, uh, like a, to be a certified uh, project management professional in the IT industry, right? Mm -hmm. um, like, what is the value of, of, you know, those very, you know, specific um, sort of credentializ credentializations, right? And because we are looking for generalists, we we don't we don't um, we don't discount the value. In fact, we embrace the value of that multifaceted um, sort of rounding out uh, of your skill set because um, we we uh, we understand and um, and seek out right that well-roundedness and 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 know from our own experiences. Um, uh, either through industry or as career consultants, um, uh, what what the what those transferable skills are um, from uh, maybe a, a, a non um, business specific uh, uh, field of study or major would be. 
Um, I, I mean, our, our SBU head is a, 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 a our, our former SBU head uh, is a, a music major, right? And um, actually toured in a rock band for a while. Like, um, but cool. the, the point is that um, uh, not having those those credentials um, is not uh, is not a barrier in any way. It, not at A and M, and and it wasn't in my story either. What uh, the way that I got to um, to where I am with that um, sort of Dornsife education was, if, if you heard the response I gave a, a little bit earlier uh, um, in the talk about um, how I didn't realize it then, um, and now I, 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 I fully appreciate uh, how important uh, my you know, critical analysis and language and persuasion skills um, right, uh, have served me really well in a space that um, is not very frequent. You don't frequently find those skills, and they're, and they're desperately needed. So okay, so just stick to the strength. Show that you're a lifelong learner, yeah. so that yeah. you are able to right. It's like cover not having it is not a deterrent, that. but you you still you still got to develop your business chops, right? I mean, yes. I was an English major you know, um, spending most of my time on, you know, doing, you know, comparative literature and it, yeah. uh, I had to learn business. I, I had the technology um, uh, from, from other work experiences. I wasn't a computer science major, but uh, I've been working, you know, um, uh, you know, with, with computers, uh, building them, taking them apart and servicing them, you know, since I was in, in high school. So, uh, so that's all I needed to do to round out Right, this picture. There you go. Cool. Yeah, I also kind of built computers, and that's, that's cool to hear. Thank you guys for the talk. It was Kyle, great. Chris, your yeah, question. Hold on, Kyle. I, I'm happy. Oh. If you don't mind, I'll add my two cents very quickly. Oh, I'm One, very happy. About um, that. Yeah, Scott. <laughs> Scott. Scott said uh, analytical skills are big, right? So if you can take, make sure you take stats classes, math classes. Make sure you uh, work in even if it's programming, right? You think, well, what's a C, C plus course has to do with consulting, right? As a consultant across any firm, whether it's A&M or anywhere else, you're going to be fact-based. You're going to get data sets with, with hundreds, you know, tens of hundreds of millions of records. You need, you need to need to be able to, to grind data. So that's something that we look for and all consulting firms look for. So I would say really highlight that. And um, if you have an opportunity, make sure you take those classes and highlight those. That, that will be a big benefit. The other piece, where you'll be at a little bit of a disadvantage not coming uh, out of a business school program is, is case interviews. So um, the large majority of consulting firms case yeah. and uh, going through the business programs, part of your curriculum is basically practice casing, right? They'll, they'll do 30, 40, 50 cases, practice cases leading up to it. And uh, it's, it's just a big part of consulting interviews and, and you're going to be behind. So take the initiative to go study casing on your own, find, find folks to, to work through cases with and do that and really practice verbalizing walking through a case uh, because that is just core to consulting interviews. And, and um, it, it's hard to understand. It, it's a little bit of a weird way to interview. It, it's very unique. It doesn't make a lot of sense unless you've had time to practice regardless of how bright you are. So mm -hmm. um, I'd say those are my two tactical pieces for you here in the next uh, next year or whatever it is, however long you have left in school. I am a senior, so it's a little too late, but your response makes me feel better because I have done those things. So. Great. <laughs> great. Again, thank you for the program. That was a great answer, Kathy. I mean, Forrest. <laughs> great. Thanks, thanks Kyle. Kyle, I actually have oh. resources I would love to send to you, like just from being- Yeah, I have resources too. So okay, cool, happen. cool, awesome. Sounds good. I'll just drop my number in the chat. Awesome. Yeah, I'll, I'll text you. Awesome. All right, sounds good, Christian. Look forward to talking to everyone. See you guys. Thanks, Kyle. And then I don't know if Sarah, if you had a question or if I, I, can, I can also go ahead. Uh, yeah, so I just obviously am sorry. I think Chris, you're on mute. I'm not sure what you. I said we just received your application. Oh, I'm okay. <laughs> uh, and so I, my question is that just looking, I I think it's amazing how cross functional A and M is in regards to 
uh, like uh, practitioners who have been career consultants and then looking at people who have been in the field. And I'd love to hear from your guys' perspective, what does that kind of look like in action? What do those interactions look like? Um, are you looking for certain things, asking certain people with certain experience or are teams like formed with certain um, qualifications in mind? Uh, you want to you want to take a crack at it, uh, Forrest? I uh, basically what what I would say is it's um, it's sort of a it's it's kind of a mix of both. It's kind of a mix of um, you know uh, what um, you know what the opportunity. It's like the stars have to align, right? Uh, in terms of the the kind of work that's coming in to be assigned to, and whether or not that matches with right, uh, or overlaps, right, with what you want to be working on. Um, and so uh, it's, um, you know, it, staffing a project and or engagement is not just a random, it's not done by computer where, you know, people who are available are just slotted in. It's a very manually intensive, very personal kind of conversation. Um, you know, again, t we take advantage of our scale. Um, you know, we, we, we love to live in both worlds, right? Um, you know, we love uh, the benefits of being a small company um, um, combined with the benefits uh, uh, that uh, you typically only find in a, in a larger company. We're also privately held, which makes a huge difference um, in a number of factors. And so um, I would say it's not random, um, uh, but uh, there is uh, there's definitely intentionality uh, placed on um, uh, put, putting uh, putting folks up for discussion um, to be staffed on an engagement based on their preferences, their experiences, uh, and and their skill sets. Is that fair? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. All right. Sure. I, I don't have too much to add on to that. Awesome. Thank you guys so much for hosting. Um, Sorry for keeping you a little bit later, but I really appreciate it. I don't know. It. It's great to meet you. Thank you so much. We, great we, to meet you guys. We enjoyed well. chatting. Thank you.